we are starting now a new lecture series, and uh, Alex Postnikov will tell us about the comment works of adjustment. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me write down the title. Title is Combinatorics of the Grassmannian. Okay, so maybe before I start, so let me ask you uh, some, a, a question. So how many of you heard about Grassmannian? Okay, so most of the people heard about it, but yeah, so some people... Oh, how many of you heard about <laughs> 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 combinatorics? Okay, so, uh, okay, maybe if you cannot uh, read English, let me try to write uh, this title in Hebrew. Uh, well, I'll try. I am not sure if it will be correct. So, actually, I'm not sure about the first letter, but maybe it's, uh, it's like this. Well, maybe combinatorics, com, the <laughs> notorics, well, combinatorica, is that correct? Or Close. 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 <laughs> 65, I think. Okay, 65, yeah. So, is the first letter, is this one or the other one? Uh, Okay, so probably a lot of changes, and uh, uh, let me try to read a Grassmannian. Ah, okay. And maybe uh, Grassmannian is something like this, ha Grassmannian. Again, I'm not sure if you uh, should write this letter here, or the other one. So is this something uh, close? <laughs> okay. A few letters, and uh, there are some we done, but it's okay. Okay. So, but that's I actually I thought that I'm going to make a lot of mistake <laughs> here, and uh, so there are many different ways to because there are like a lot of different ways to write it to read it because there are no vowels, so it can be combinatorica or combinatorica or Combinatorica, and so on. Uh, so, so there are a lot of combinations. So, a lot of, and uh, and that's like what we do in combinatorics. So, we study combinations, study how many ways are there to combine things. So, uh, so I'll try to talk a little bit about these uh, combinations. And uh, okay, now let me. Well, maybe before I start, let me say a few general things. Because I think that these combinatorics, these discrete objects, are really kind of in the essence of the laws of the universe. So, well, maybe that's a very general uh, word, but uh, maybe one can make it even, maybe they have a mean, even more precise meaning. Uh, so, actually, if you look at this uh, booklet that I've got here, so there are some uh, uh, things written here. So let me try to look at them. At, and uh, there were some famous people here who were visited this institute. And they said nice words about this institute. So one of these people is uh, Nima Arkami Hamed. So he said, I visited the IAS in Jerusalem. Well, many, numerous number of times. It's a very nice place. So recently, there was a work of Nima Arkami Hamed and other physicists who found uh, what they call Grassmannian formula for the scattering amplitudes. So and in this formula, it turns out that some combinatorial objects that we are going to maybe mention in these uh, four lectures, they actually play a very crucial role. So really, maybe, like in the future, physics, combinatorics will going to play a very important role. Maybe, that's my hope, so we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But really, so these objects may be very, very kind of help us to understand how laws of nature work. Okay, anyway, so let me start. That was an introduction. So let me start uh, with more concrete things. So I'm going to fix 
two numbers, <coughs> two numbers, k and n. So there are two integers, k is less than n, and I'm going to fix a uh, field f, and, uh, well, it's a field. And to make things more concretely, I like to think about things that are concretely. I'm going to actually assume most of the time that f is just the complex numbers, or real numbers. So you can pick your favorite field, C or R. OK. And uh, then the Grassmannian, GR, KN, over this field, it is the manifold of k-dimensional linear subspaces in the n-dimensional linear space. OK? So that's the definition. So the manifold of k-dimensional. So for example, uh, if k equals to 1, Grassmannian 1n, that's the manifold of lines in n-dimensional space. So that's what is called projective space, p n minus 1. So the points of this uh, projective space are just uh, well, lines that pass through the origin. Uh, so and how can you think about these lines? So you can pick a vector that spans the line, and the vector, it has, it's like n vectors, it has n coordinates. So it's x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. But if you multiply all these numbers by, say, 2, take twice this vector, that's going to give you the same line. So, the, and to indicate this, people usually use this notation, the semicolons, so you don't put commas, but these dots. So that indicates that we are allowed to multiply all numbers by the same non-zero number simultaneously. Okay, this is Grassmannian for k equals to 1. And in general, so how do we think about Grassmannian in general? For other case, we can think about this in a very concrete way. If you want to define a k-dimensional subspace, you just pick k vectors that spend this subspace. And you put these k vectors in the rows of the matrix. So basically, what you have is a matrix points, well, points of Grassmannian kn are just k by n matrices, well, a. Uh, of, well, we should say that uh, these uh, rows of this matrix span k dimensional subspace. That means that the rank of this matrix should be the maximal possible rank. So rank equals to k. Okay, so you have a k by n matrix of rank k, uh, and uh, uh, of course there are different matrices that represent the same point on the Grassmannian. So if you take one row and add to another row, that will be a different matrix, but it will be the same point of the Grassmannian. So really, you need to consider matrices modular row operations. So if you look. Look at the matrices, smaller row operations. That's exactly what Grassmannian is. So basically, that's essentially just matrices. Okay, what I just described to you is a uh, well. There are two dual ways to think about Grassmannian. What I just described to you is a kind of row picture. So if you have a matrix, you can think about these matrix in terms of rows. But there is a dual way to think about matrices in terms of columns. Okay, now let's. What's the column picture for the Grassmannian? Now you can look at the columns of these k by n matrices. So that's going to be n vectors in a smaller dimensional, in k-dimensional space. Now I have, say, our field is k, r, so take r to the k, and you pick a bunch of vectors, v1, v2, dot, 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 vn. So that's a bunch of vectors that describes your point of the Grassmannian. OK? So for example, in this particular case, all these vectors are on the plane, so that's an example of a point of the Grassmannian for k equals to 2. OK, now let me try to give you some examples for k equals to 3. So if k equals to 3, so you need to pick vectors in a three-dimensional space. So it's a little bit hard for me to draw three-dimensional vectors. I don't know, some people can make three-dimensional pictures very well, but I'm not so good at this. Uh, but I can uh, represent these three-dimensional vectors by two-dimensional points. OK, so the way to do that, that's kind of projective picture. 
so I'm going to pick, uh, that's my origin, and I'm going to pick some, hyper, some generic hyperplane, a fine hyperplane that does not pass through the origin. So pick some, so that's like R3, and I'm going to pick some kind of R2 here. Okay, now if you have a bunch of vectors, so for each of these vectors I take the line that spent by this vector, so for, instead of vectors now we have lines, and these lines are going to intersect my plane at some points. Okay, so instead of arrangement, configuration of vectors in R3, we have configuration of points in R2. So for k equals to 3, you can represent Grassmannian just by uh, picking a bunch of points on the plane. So they might have uh, some kind of nice arrangement. I don't know, something, something like this, maybe. So basically, we have a bunch of points, arbitrary collection of points on the plane. OK, this is, uh, well, they, well, in this picture, we lose a little bit of information. Just we lose a little bit of information because what we lose, so once you replace vector by a point, you know, you, you know this vector only up to rescaling. So that means that actually, to actually get a point on the Grassmannian for each of these points on the plane, you have one extra parameter, non-zero parameter, kind of rescaling constants. So to actually get a point of the Grassmannian, you should also put some numbers for each of these uh, points. But anyway, so that's way how to think about the Grassmannian. And we want to understand the combinatorics of uh, such configurations, arrangements of uh, points or vectors and so on. OK. And in order to do this, a very helpful tool to do it is uh, called uh, Plucker coordinates. So that's some very nice coordinate system on the Grassmannian. So let me tell you. In order to tell, I need to find an eraser. Oh, it's here. So what are the Plucker coordinates? Well, I just, yeah, they, oh, let's, let's erase them. Yeah, we don't, well, later we'll need them, but just a bunch of points on the plane. Okay? So a bunch of points, well, labeled by, well, they are like, this is like V1, V2, V3. So I put some edges because sometimes this point can happen to be on the same line. So then I can draw the line. So just to indicate that these points are on the line. And later that's going to be important for us. But right now, this is just some collection of points on, on, on the plane. OK, so now, so what are the Plucker coordinates? OK, so let me first fix some uh, notation. So common notation in commentaries. Well, math is a. Uh, n in brackets means the set of numbers from 1 up to n. And uh, n choose k is the set of k element subsets. Of n. Okay. Uh, then uh, let A be k by n matrix, as before, that represents a point on the Grassmannian. And the I, capital I, is going to be some element of n choose k. Capital I in this lecture will always be a k element subset of numbers. So then delta I of A is going to be the maximal minor of this matrix maximal minor of A in a column, in columns, columns, column set I. So in other words, we have some K by N matrix. That's my A. And you have some subset of columns. That's I. And then you take uh, the square submatrix, K by K submatrix of A. And you take the determinant of this square submatrix. So that's called what's maximal minor. And we have n choose k. So, so, so what we get is that if you have a matrix, then we get the binomial coefficient of all possible uh, maximal minors. n choose k maximal minors. 
delta i. Okay? And these maximal minors are called Plucker coordinates. Yeah, so just they are complex numbers. Uh, how do you define maximal minor? Just in the same way, that's a square submatrix. So it's not maximal value. No, not, yeah, it's not maximal, sorry. But it's maximal by size. It's ma minor of maximal possible size. In this case, it's like k by k minor, if you like. <coughs> okay. So you have that many, and that, they form a... They are, so they have an, these are some numbers, like real or complex or whatever, you feel this. And, uh, and, uh, but now remember that the grass plane is not just matrices, but matrices point all the row operations. So what happens if you do some row operations? So if you say multiply one row by two. In this case, all maximal minors are multiplied by two. And so it's not very hard to see that that's the only thing that can happen. The only thing is then you perform row operations you simultaneously multiply all these deltas by the same non-zero numbers. So really, these Fluker corners are defined up to simultaneous rescaling. So they form what is called projective coordinates. So we get a Fluker embedding. So the Grassmannian, this gives a way to map a Grassmannian, Kn, into not not R, but projective space of dimension n choose k minus 1. So in other words, for any matrix, you set it to collection of these Plucker coordinates, which are defined up to rescaling. So that's point in the projective space. OK. So let me give you an example. So the main example. That's basically going to be the most important example. Then k equals to 2 and n equals to 4. So in this case, so we are talking about Grassmannian 2, 4 of planes in four-dimensional, Grassmannian of planes in four-dimensional space. So we have six Fluker coordinates. So we have delta 1, 2, Delta 1, 3, delta, what else? 2, oh, 1, 4, delta 2, 3, well, and so on. Delta 2, 4, and delta 3, 4. So, and they form projective coordinates. So, I really need to put not commas, but these semi columns between them to indicate that we're allowed to rescale them simultaneously. Okay, now these things are non algebraically independent. So there is some relation between these deltas. So they're not like usual coordinates in uh, Euclidean space or projective space. There are some relations between these deltas. And in this case, we have one relation, one algebraic relation. So this relation says that they satisfy the following equation, delta 1, 3 times delta 2, 4 equals to delta 1, 2 times delta 3, 4 plus Delta 1, 4 times delta. Can, can you see here? Delta 2, 3. So can, does everybody see? I think people who are sitting there don't see the. Oh, you see the indices. OK. OK, so these are, but if you cannot remember, so, so there is a very simple rule to remember these indices. Because I can represent this plug relation by a very simple picture. So we can draw a circle and put four points on the circle in a clockwise order, one, two, three, four. And if I have, a, and I'm going to represent delta one, three by a diagonal, by a chord from one to three. So this product can be represented by the two pair of crossing uh, chords. And uh, this equals to, uh, so again, one, two, three, four. So here we have a pair of uh, chords like this plus a pair of chords like this. So in other words, whenever you have two crossing chords, it's equal to the sum of two ways to uncross them. Yeah, I think this, this picture is a bit misleading because- This one? You know, yes, because, you know, okay, but there are three two partitions of four and one itself, that's easy. But the tricky point is how to arrange the signs so the formula is correct, right? Okay, right, but 
yeah, that, that is a trick here, way, but that's, I mean, in this case, that's the, well, well that, but that's kind of the way, what I'm saying that this picture is the way to remember the rule, the way how, like in this case, and actually for this uh, example, two by four, so two crossing things equals to two, two ways to uncross them. And uh, this, and actually later we will see that this, you see that already here, crossing and non-crossing plays a role. Important role, and that's going to be important for us. So later, and I think there are some deep relationship with free probability because in free probability there are also like some non-crossing partitions. Okay, so this is going to also be appear in this theory, crossing and non-crossing things. But actually, I should tell you that this formula, this relation, like this particular relation, wasn't even found by Plucker. It was known a long time before Plucker. It was known to ancient Greeks. So maybe you know Plato theorem. So you know Plato theorem? So this theorem says that if you have a circle, and if you have a, any quadrilateral, so in this case we have a kind of square, but it doesn't need to be a square. It can be any quadrilateral inscribed inside the circle. So maybe something like this. Then theorem says that length of this diagonal times length of this diagonal equals to sum of two products. It's equal to product, product of these two guys plus products of two other opposite sides. So really, this plus correlation was known to Asian Greeks. And many things about Grassmannian were, were known to Asian Greeks. So, and uh, this is, a, is an example for k equals to 2 and equals to 4. But similar relation hold uh, for general n and k, and they are called Plucker relations. So, uh, and these Plucker relations have the following form. Why they are equivalent? No, they're not like really that kind of similar. <laughs> so <you can> <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that they're equivalent, but uh, you can actually probably make them equivalent. But, uh, well, they have a similar form. And now, like, usually the current way to call this kind of structure, it's called cluster algebra. So really, there are some uh, recent theory of Fabian Zielinski of cluster algebras, where relations of this form that some product equals to two other, mono some of two other monomials, this is called the mutate, well, anyway, so these kind of relations are called mutations. Just historical remark, it's Ptolemy's, Ptolemy Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I had in my notes. Yeah, thank you. Ptolemy theorem. Yeah, thank you for the correction. Yeah, that's Ptolemy, yeah. Okay, so in general, look at relations. have the following form. So if you have, actually, I'm not going to give you the most general case, but the relations that we'll need have the following form. So if you have two subsets, i and j, two k element subsets, and you have a little i element of capital I, then delta i times delta j equals to sum over all little j in uh, capital J plus or minus delta i minus little i, I think I should put curly braces here, but I'm lazy to do it, union with little j times delta j minus little j union with, uh, oh, mi minus little j union with little i. And everywhere I should put these little things into curly braces, but I'm, oh, actually let me do it. Okay, so that's the relation. It has this form, but as you said, the tricky part is to put the signs here. And I'm not, I mean, if I had more than four lectures, probably I'll explain to you in details how to do it. I'm going to leave it for you as an exercise. So the tricky part is to figure out there is an explicit commensurate rule how to put these signs here so that this relation is true. Okay, but we have uh, these kind of relations.
Now, so my goal is to give a combinatorial model for the Grassmannian, some kind of associate, some combinatorial objects to the Grassmannian. And um, here model is kind of, is not something very precise. It's a bit vague term. So in general, I, wa I want to associate some combinatorial objects with the Grassmannian, and there are going to be actually several different types of objects associated to the Grassmannian. Uh, yes? Yeah, right, so, so, so yeah, uh, well, actually, you should say it's enough to sum over. So if you, you, you add something and then you remove something. Yeah, well, actually, it's enough to write. Maybe I should make it more precise because I'm, I'm being a little bit vague here. So it's, okay, so it's enough to make this summation. But actually... I mean, this formula that I wrote originally also correct, but there are going to be like some consolations there. Okay. Uh, so, there is a first kind of, first kind of combinatorial objects associated with the, the grass mine are related, very closely related with the action of torus on the grass mine. So, we have complex torus. So, which is T, just complex, non zero complex numbers to the nth power. So, this is a group. And this group acts on the Grassmannian. Well, and in the most trivial way you can, can imagine. So, let me, if we want to think about in a concrete way in terms of matrices. So, if you have matrix K by N matrix A, so, and if I have a <laughs> element of the toes, like t, little t1 dot 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 little tn is going to be element of the toes, just some non-zero complex numbers, what it does to this matrix, it just rescales the columns of the matrix by t1, t2, and so on. So, rescale the columns of A by T1 dot dot, dot Tn. You just multiply columns by these Ts. So that's very trivial action, the most obvious action you can imagine. But already this very simple action leads to very interesting combinatorial structure. So by the way, so I see, so today, actually what I'm going to tell today to you, it's kind of uh, some kind of background information. So I'm going to, uh, so in the, so some of you may already know a lot about these Plucker coordinates and other things. So, but later in the, so right now I'm going, in this lecture, I'm going to cover these kind of basic things about the Rasmine and then later I'm going to move to more recent uh, results. Okay, so anyway, so we have these complex torus and uh, on Plucker coordinates, this section is also very trivial. So what it does uh, to the Plucker coordinates, you have Plucker coordinate, again, and they're just rescaled by t's. So delta i goes to product, <coughs> product of all little i, in capital I, c i, delta i. So this t is just rescale the Plucker coordinates. That's, again, very easy to figure out from the formulas. So have this very simple action, and uh, if you have action of the torus on any manifold, so you can look at the orbits of these torus. Pick a point of the Grassmannian and act by the torus. You get some uh, uh, subset. Take the closure of this subset, the risky closure, and that is going to be. This is what is called toric variety. And if you I don't know if some of you know a little bit about toric varieties. You know that the toric varieties are very much related to polytopes. So action of torus naturally leads to some uh, polytopes. So the geometry of uh, orbits of the torus are related to combinatorics of polytopes. So let me tell you exactly, very precisely, how these polytopes look like in this case. And uh, 
again, so if we have action of the toes, then, like in a <laughs> very general setup, we have something what is called moment map. So what is the moment map in our case? So that's the map mu from the Grassmannian, say over complex numbers, to a real to r to the n. Okay? So it's the map from the you know manifold, complex manifold, to just real affine space r to the n. And uh, let me tell you exactly how it's given. In this case, if you have a point in the Grassmannian represented by k by n matrix A, this matrix goes to vector x1. Now, I, I just put not semicolons, but just co usual uh, uh, commas. So we have vector x1 up to xn in Rn. So which is given by the following formula. xi is equal to the sum overall subsets i that contain little i. So you have fixed little i and you sum over all subsets containing this particular element, take the corresponding Plutor coordinate, take its absolute value and take, take its square. And in the numerator, uh, in the denominator, you sum over all subsets j over all n choose k subsets. Square of the Plutor coordinate. Okay, so uh, so uh, uh, that means that for all little x's, little x's, the denominator is the same, but the numerators are going to be different. So then we have this map, uh, and a very important result about moment map. It's called convexity theorem. Okay, so by Atya. Gilman and Sternberg. Okay, they proved convexity theory in a theorem in a like more general, in a very general setup of any torus action on manifold satisfying some conditions. But in our case, this theorem just says that the image of this moment map mu of the Grassmannian is a convex polytope. So this map sends your geometric kind of smooth Geometrical object into some uh, very combinatorial object, like in a, into a convex polytope. And moreover, the vertices of, the, let me call this polytope P, the vertices of this polytope are images, are the images of T fixed points. Okay, so this theorem says that we have a convex polytope and have a very simple description of meaning of uh, of the vertices of this uh, polytope. So, and uh, the main lesson here is that once you have an action of the toes on something, the first thing that you need to do is to figure out the fixed points of this action. Okay, so and let's try to figure out the fixed points because that's very easy exercise. So, what are the fixed points? What are the points which are fixed by T? Again, we have uh, so T fixed points. Okay. So there are several ways to figure them out. That's very simple, but probably the easiest, well, maybe actually all of them are pretty easy. But one way to figure out the fixed points is just to look at this formula. So we have a bunch of Plutor coordinates, 
these delta i's, and you scale them by some t's, and these t's can be arbitrary numbers, arbitrary non-zero numbers, and what you get should be the same thing as this one. So this thing should be exactly the same as this for any t. <coughs> and if you just think about for a few seconds, you realize that the only possibility for this to happen if all deltas except one are equal to zero. Okay? So t, t fixed points means that uh, exactly one delta i is not equal to zero. And all other delta i's are zero. Okay? So there are going to be n choose k, the binomial coefficient n choose k fixed points. And uh, like to make it even more concrete, so the matrix, they are represented by the following matrix. So you have this k by n matrix. So you have this subset i. You want to make all Plucker coordinates except 1 to be 0. So basically, you need to put zeros everywhere except this uh, square submatrix. And this square submatrix, we can put arbitrary non-singular matrix, maybe just identity matrix or any other non-singular matrix. Okay, so that's this matrix represents a fixed point. And uh, yes? Yeah, but yeah, they're defined up to simultaneous rescaling. Okay, so it means that like if one of them is not, I mean, one of them should be non-zero, right? So, and if you take this non-zero delta, you rescale it, you get something else, but it is still the same because it's still just kind of rescaled by the same constant. But, but if you have two non-zero deltas, then it will be rescaled by, well, you can pick T so that coefficients which, which you rescale them are different from each other. Okay, so if you take this particular matrix, apply this moment map, <coughs> then you get, again, it's very trivial exercise, you get a, four, a point, uh, well, x1 dot xn, which is very simple. So this point is just, uh, well, xi equals to 1 if little i is in capital I and 0 if little i is not in capital I. So in other words, for any k element subset, you just take 0, 1 vector, like the most obvious 0, 1 vector that represents the subset. You put 1s in the position that, can, well, in the indices that belongs to your subset and 0 everywhere else. That's, uh, that's, so these fixed points are 0, 1 vectors with k 1s and n minus k <coughs> zeros. And that's the moment polytope. So that, that's the vertices of this moment polytope. OK. And as you know, if you don't think about polytopes, there are two dual ways to think about polytopes. You can think about polytopes in terms of uh, vertices or in terms of the facets, in terms of the linear inequalities. So let me also describe the same polytope using inequalities and equalities. Okay, I claim that the same, another description of this polytope is just to, uh, I'm going to tell you what the inequality is. It's just uh, equality is that x1 plus x2 plus the root plus xn equals to k. Okay. Why that has to be true? Just from this formula. So if you add all these x's together, you see all of them have the same denominator. All of them you just divide by squares of all Plucker coordinates. Sum of squares of all Plucker coordinates. Numerator will be different. But if you sum over all little i, you count each square of the Plucker coordinate exactly k times. Right? So that means that sum of all x's will be, numerator will be k times the denominator. So this sum equals to k. And the other condition is that xi, obviously, they are, non -neg they are positive numbers, non negative Right, you count each delta capital I, <coughs> uh, you need to sum over little i. So, and capital I contains k elements, you count each of them exactly k times. Okay? The other thing is that obviously from this formula that these numbers are non-zero. 
because you have only squares of something. And uh, they are less than 1 because, again, all terms in the numerator are just some subset of terms in the denominator. So obviously, numerator is less than or equal than denominator. So they are less than 1. And I claim that actually that's all conditions that you need to describe this polytope. These are conditions. So you have a bunch of numbers from 0 to 1 with fixed sum. And uh, exercise for you, uh, that's pretty easy exercise, but exercise to check that this polytope is the same as this polytope. So these inequalities defining exactly the same polytope as uh, the polytope with these vectors, uh, with these zero one ver ve vectors which are 0, 1 vertices. Okay, and this polytope has a special name. It's called the hypersimplex. Okay, and now I'm going to do a very bad thing for mathematics. Very bad thing. I'm going to denote this hypersimplex by delta kn. So why it's bad? Because this delta has nothing to do with this delta. So this is, but somehow I'm kind of get used to these notations. So this is not a Plucker coordinates, that's a polytope, delta kn. So I mean, I could pick a different letter, but I, if I'll pick a different letter, I'll probably start making a lot of mistakes. Okay, so that's the hypersimplex. And uh, clearly, if k equals to 1, what is this polytope? The vertices are just exactly the coordinate vectors. So that's exactly the coordinate simplex. So it means that if k equals to 1, that's the coordinate simplex. And if k is greater than 1, that's something more general than coordinate simplex. This is why it's called hypersimplex. It's a generalization of a simplex. Uh, and uh, let me give you one example how this polytope looks like. Again, the main like example, k equals to 2 and n equals to 4. So then the hypersimplex, delta 2n, it's actually the octahedron. So you can, again, that's an exercise to check that this polytope is the octahedron. So the vertices here, for example, this say vertex is 1, 1, 0, 0. This is opposite vertex is 0, 0, 1, 1. Say so this vertex is 0, 1, 1, 0. The vertex on the back is 1, 0, 0, 1. The top vertex is 1, 0, 1, 0. And the bottom vertex is 0, 1, 0, 1. Again, good exercise if you have not seen it before is just check that this hypersimplex exactly looks like this. It's the octahedron. Another, a little bit less trivial exercise is to describe the edges of the hypersimplex. So I claim that the edges, so let me tell you what are the edges, just by lo look at this example. So the vertices are 0, 1 vectors, and you connect them by edge exactly if you replace 1, like if you switch 1, 0 with 1, 1. Okay? So now once you connect these two points by an edge, if they are closest to each other, as close to each other as possible in the Euclidean space. So it means that we only replace single 0 with a switch a single 0 with a single 1. Okay? So for example, we don't connect this guy with this guy by an edge because here you need to replace two ones with two zeros switch first to once with two zeros. So that's not an edge. But if but here you just switch one zero with one one. Exercise check that these are exactly the edges of the hypersimplex. hypersimplex. Next thing about the hypersimplex is uh, and actually so let me so when I'm supposed to finish? So how much Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. So another 
thing about the nice thing about the hydrosymbolics that there is a very nice combinatorial meaning of the volume of the hydrosymplex. Okay, so the volume of this polytope the <coughs> normalized oh let me write it here. Oh anyway. The normalized Volume of the hypersimplex equals to the Eulerian number a k minus one and minus one. Well, I should tell you what normalized volume means and what the Eulerian number means. So the volume normalized, so notice that this hydrosimplex is actually it lives in n-dimensional spaces, but it's actually n minus one dimensional because it lives in a hyperplane. Right? So so there is some ambiguity how to define volume of uh, polytope in a n minus one dimensional space. So we fix the volume by saying that the volume of the say unit simplex in this hyperplane equals to one. So say the volume of the first hypersimplex is one, and that's how we normalize the volume. Okay? So if you have this display, sum of coordinates equals to k, yeah. then you see the, the intersection with the positive hyper quadrant. And you say that this is... Yeah, so, so, yeah, maybe should, uh, let, let me tell you what this uh, uh, polydope is. So you, first of all, these conditions, yeah. it's the hypercube, right? So that's, so you have the unit hypercube, 0, 1 to the nth power, some hypercube. <coughs> and you intersect this hypercube with the hyperplane, sum of the coordinates equals to constant, equals to k. So you pick some hyperplane, or maybe this one, intersect it, and that's, that's the first hypersimplex. You see that's in this case, it's just the usual simplex. It's this triangle. sum of coordinates equal to 1. Yeah, right. If you, in this case, actually, in three-dimensional, for three-dimensional cubes, there will be two hypersimplices, and both of them are triangles. But if you go to higher dimension, so you have uh, one, one looks like this, and the other looks like the other triangle. That's sum of coordinates equals to two. But if you go to higher dimension, the first hypersimplex will be just the usual three-dimensional uh, tetrahedron. Then you get the second hypersimplex, which is the octahedron. And then you get the third hypersimplex, which is again the tetrahedron. So in three dimensions, you have tetrahedron, octahedron, tetrahedron for n equals to 4. Okay? So this is how these hypersimplices look like. And I claim is that if you normalize the volume so that the volume of the first one equals to 1, then the volume of the other will, be, will have some interesting combinatorial meaning. It's equal to the Eulerian number. So then what's the Eulerian number? So that's the number of permutations of size n. So w equals to w1 up to wn minus 1. Permutations of numbers 1 up to n minus 1. With k minus 1 descents. OK, so what's a descent in a permutation? It's exactly the place there where the permutation goes down. So in other words, that the number of indices i such that wi is greater than wi minus 1, this number should be equal to k minus 1. Oh, i plus 1, yeah. Thank you. So these are called descents. And that's the combinatorial meaning of the uh, volume of the hypersimplex. So for example, for n equals to 4, you need to look at permutations of three letters. So let me write all of them. It's 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1, well, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1. So what else? 
three one two and three two one. So for the first one, it always goes up. This one has zero descents. So these four permutations have exactly one position, then it goes down, right? So these have one descent. And this permutation has two descents. OK? So it means that the volume of this normalized volume of the second hypersimplex should be equal to 4. So that means that this uh, octahedron has volume 4. And one way to, well, I mean, assuming that the volume of the standard unit uh, tetrahedron is 1, so this octahedron has volume 4. And one way to see it, you can kind of cut it into two pyramids, like top and bottom one. And then you can cut each pyramid into two uh, tetrahedra. OK. And uh, this uh, calculation of volume of the hydrosimplex, it goes back to Laplace. So Laplace did it maybe 200 years ago. And of course, he does, didn't use terms hypersimplex or descents, and he did it in totally different terms. And actually, at some point, I look at his, at his collected papers and found the place where uh, people say that he calculated the volume of the hypersimplex. I couldn't really figure out what he did there. So, but he was talking about some probability, so his motivation, so that volumes have some <coughs> meaning it's equal to probability of some random variable. And uh, anyway, so somehow he calculated this volume. Uh, but more recently, Oh, really? Maybe, maybe. OK. Well, actually, Euler, yeah, Euler defined a little number without, yeah, that's true. He defined these numbers without using descents. Because we can define these numbers just algebraically. Uh, there is a very nice story about these numbers. OK. But uh, more recently, uh, Richard Stanley found another kind of more combinatorial proof of this result. So, and what he did, he found a nice way to triangulate these hypersimplex into unit simplices, into that many unit simplices. So there is a very nice commercial way to, to see this formula. And I really like this paper because it just uh, takes half page. So it's half page paper. It's the shortest paper that I've seen uh, where he calculates this. Now, let me try to explain how to, in a, in a different way, so I'm going to explain this in a more complicated way. So I, I, I'm taking this nice and simple construction of Stanley, and I'm going to make it more confusing. So that's my purpose. Uh, but that will be helpful because that I'll have some further generalization in mind that I'll talk about later. So how to see that uh, the hypersimplex is subdivided into simplices? OK, so for this, it's very helpful to talk about a fine Coxeter arrangement. Well, of type A. So what is the fine Coxeter arrangement of type A? Uh, so let's. Y1 dot dot Ym be coordinates in the space R to the N modular vector 1, 1, 1. OK, so that's going to be N minus 1 dimensional space. Isomorphic to R to the N minus 1. So I, in other words, I'm a factor by this line. So it means that these Ys are defined <laughs> up to simultaneous adding the same constant to them. OK, and for this uh, space, I'm going to look at the hyperplanes. Given by condition, yi minus yj equals to, well, I, can, I, can stop, I cannot talk about y's themselves because they're defined up to constant, but I can talk about their differences. Differences have the meaning. So yi minus yj equals to r. So where r is an integer. So this is called a fine Coxeter arrangement. So for example, for n equals to 3, so you start with the usual Coxeter arrangement in this case, which is oh, braid arrangement. 
it looks like this. And then I take, translate all these hyperplanes by integer vectors in all directions. So I'm looking at pictures like this. OK, so I translate one of them, and then I translate the other one. And the third one. So that's some kind of infinite arrangement. You see that it has a very nice uh, regular structure. It's actually, the, in this case, it's the triangular lattice on the plane. Uh, so that's how the Cox arrangement looks like for n equals to three, uh, and uh, you can. And actually, the fundamental fact about this Cox arrangement is that regions of these arrangements are going to be simplices. So in this case, all regions are triangles, and that is going to be true. So in a sense, this affine Cox arrangement is a nice multi-dimensional generalization of this triangular lattice, and in general, the regions will be sim all regions will be simplices, which are kind of have the same volume, and they actually obtain from each other by reflections. You can start with one of these simplices, and these simplices are called Alcoves. So you can start with one of these Alcoves, maybe this one, and call it fundamental Alcov, and then start reflecting it with respect to the walls. So you reflect it, you get another one, then reflect it in the other direction, get another one, and so on. Uh, and if you keep reflecting them, you will get all Cox arrangement. And that is strong not only for the plane, but in any dimension. So that's the important fact about this Cox arrangement. And uh, a good exercise for you, if you haven't seen it before, prove it. Try to see why. Because if you just pick random hyperplane <laughs> arrangements, then the regions can be any polytopes. But for these particular arrangements, all of them will be these uh, simplices. OK. Of, and of the same volume. And uh, Together with Thomas Lamb, we study the class of polytopes, which we called Alcov polytopes. So Alcov polytopes are polytopes which are given by inequalities whose walls talk later. OK. Uh, so the out of polytopes are polyrows which are convex polyrows which are unions of some subsets of, of some of these alcoves. For example, we can have a polytope like this. So this polytope is an alcove polytope. So some convex polytopes which are formed by these alcoves. OK, we study these polyrows, and we found that they have a very nice structure. They have uh, nice uh, features. OK, and uh, one nice feature about these Alcoff polyrows that just comes for free from their definition, <coughs> that they come with a triangulation. They're already subdivided into these simplices, just from their definition, because they're defined as union of simplices. So they already have a very nice and regular triangulation. Now point that I'm trying to make is that this hypersimplex is an Alcoff polytope. So this hypersimplex is a polytope of this type. And uh, if you look at the definition, at the inequalities that I gave you, it may not be immediately obvious that it's an Alcoff polytope. So for example, this Octahedron that I just erased is subdivided into four simplices, but in a very special way, like, like this. So, well, I mean, if you draw a, a picture like this in a three-dimensional space, then uh, you can actually combine some of these alcoves to get the octahedron that I just erased. OK, now let's, le let me explain you how to do that. So in general, remember that. This polytope is given by an equ equation like this. Some of all coordinates is a constant. And all axes are between 0 and 1. OK, now here we have inequalities, but they're not exactly of this form. So for Alcoff polytopes, we should have uh, all inequalities should have the form yi minus yj is greater than some constant. 
So here we have uh, also very simple inequality, but of a different form. So let me use different coordinates. So I'm going to, instead of this axis, I'm going to use different coordinates y. And these y's are going to be, yi is going to be just sum of x1 plus x2 plus the dot plus xi. Okay, just use very simple change of coordinates. Uh, so then, of course, also, well, we're, well, from this, we, we see that y0 equals to 0 and yn equals to, if you add up all x's, you get k. So in particular, yn equals to y0 plus k. Somehow you have <coughs> y1 up to yn, but you can also define a y0 to be 0. Okay. Now, how to express x's in terms of y's? That's also very easy. So xi equals to yi minus yi minus 1. So if i equals to 2 dot dot, dot n, and for x1 it is slightly different. So x1 equals to y1 minus y0. But remember y0 equals to yn minus k. So it's equal to y1 minus yn plus k. OK? And now I'm going to rewrite these conditions. I mean, this condition is uh, going to be given for me, to me for free. But let me uh, rewrite these inequalities. So these inequalities are written in the form. OK, let me erase this. So now x1, well, well xi is going to be yi minus yi minus 1. It should be between 0 and 1 for 1, for i from 2 up to n. And for x1, we have y1 minus yn plus k is also between 0 and 1. OK? So. Be because I want to have differences. So I want to express everything in terms of differences of y's. I want to have inequalities of this form. So there's a little technical, uh, little details, which is uh, kind of very tiny, but it's kind of important, is that, so remember, so in this uh, fine Cox arrangement, there is some ambiguity. So these y's are defined up to a constant, up to adding a constant. Here, in this coordinates, we kind of fix this ambiguity by say, fixing one of the y's. So if you like, these y's are kind of potentials, but really in physics, potentials don't have the meaning, but potential differences have the meaning, right? So you can think about these y's as potentials, but differences of y's have concrete physical meaning, but we can fix this ambiguity by setting one of the, by kind of picking your, like, grounding one of the vertices. So here we can ground yn, set it to a constant. Okay, but basically that's the same thing as saying that we are working model of this vector, 1, 1, 1. So anyway, so point is that now this polydope is written in terms of differences of y's. That's an Alkov polydope. And then, uh, well, again, I don't want to finish this proof. That's, uh, I think, also a very good exercise for you. To, but claim is that this polydope is naturally subdivided into Alkovs. And these alcoves are labeled by some kind of permutations, by affine permutations. Again, I don't have enough time to explain what they are, but they're labeled by some permutations. And uh, exercise for you to see that actually these alcoves inside of these polytopes correspond to permutations with exactly k descents. So before you were counting those descents in elements of permutation. Yes. Here you have a little different coxeter group. Yeah, here we have a fine Coxer group. Yeah, that's. So what's the? Could you, could you give some hint? Yeah, some hint is that actually, right? That's a very good detail that I was trying to, don't, spend much time on it. But you're right. So these regions are actually labeled by, uh, not the usual permutations, by by some affine permutations. There are infinitely many affine permutations. That's fine per usual permutation with some extra information. But inside, so but actually, let me. Let me actually tell you, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on on this planar picture because on planar picture everything is very trivial. But this polytope given by these conditions is going to be this kind of fundamental. 
So there is a map from affine permutations to the usual permutations. Okay, affine permutations are usual permutations for all some extra information. So inside of this part, like these inequalities, define like kind of hyper some polytope which is linear isomorphic to hypercube. In this case, it's this uh, rhombus. So it's the affine permutations for these rhombus. So if you project them to usual permutations, then it's injection. So you uh, for permutations that sit inside of here, you actually get some subsets of the usual permutations. And if you go through all details that I'm skipping, you will see that these are going to be exactly permutations if given number of descents. OK. Next thing that I want to talk a little bit about is uh, Matroid, Matroid stratification. Matroid stratification of the Grassmannian. OK. So what should I raise? OK, let me, okay, let me raise this. So let me go back. So went a little bit. So maybe later in the following lectures, this all costs will appear again. But now I'm going to return to the Grassmannian. Uh, so Matroid stratification. OK, so remember, a point in the Grassmannian Well, it's just given by a bunch of local coordinates, right? Now, we want to, so that's, you know, they have some values. Now, if we want to talk about matroids, want to get some kind of combinatorial information for this, we want to forget about actual values of the Plucker coordinates. We don't care about the exact values of these Plucker coordinates, but we want to only remember whether they're equal to 0 or not 0. So we're only interested which Plucker coordinates are 0 and which of them are non 0. That's the matroid data. So matroid data about this point, let me call it M, that's the subset of Plucker coordinates which are not equal to 0. OK. So what does it mean in terms of, so let me explain what this matroid data means in terms of these uh, arrangements of vectors or points. So remember, so let me do one concrete example of matroid. Uh, <coughs> for k equals to 3. So remember, uh, point in the grass plane for k equals to 3 can be graphically represented by a collection of points on the plane. It's vectors in three-dimensional space or points on the plane. So let me pick some particular, like any collection of points on the plane, maybe like this. Well, actually, since I'm given uh, k equals to 3 or n equals k to k equals to 3. So this uh, k equals to 3. So it means that I'm, my, uh, I'm looking at mat and 3 by n matrices. And the columns are going to be a bunch of three-dimensional vectors, okay, which can be represented by two-dimensional points. So I have a bunch of points on the plane. OK, and let me make a one concrete example. So I'm going to, since I'm giving a lecture in Israel, so let me make a very special Matroid. <laughs> well, yeah, like this. Well, yeah, anyway, so that, let me take this Matroid. Well, let me make a bet. Yeah. So that's called the Magen David Matroid. <laughs> OK, so, well, but that works for any collection of points. So let me take this. And you need to label these points by numbers, maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So what is it? what's the Matroid? So what's the Matroid which is represented by these points? We, we care whether three points, that's a collection of three element subsets, we care, so that's example for n equals to k equals to 3 and n equals to 12. So we care whether three of these points are on the same line or not. Okay? So if three points are not on the same line, it belongs, the subset belongs to the matroid. So the corresponding matroid 
uh, well, it can pay, well, for example, one, two, three are not on the same line. So one, two, three belongs to Matroid. So in this example, one, two, three subset is in M. But for example, two, three, four are on the same line. So these points are not linearly independent. So two, three, four does not belong to M. OK, so that's the Matroid white token. So we basically can start with any collection of points on the plane and just construct the Matroid. So that's the Matroid data. So when we have, talk about arrangements, again, I don't care about exact positions of these points, but I care whether they are on the same line or not on the same line. OK. And uh, we can subdivide the Grassmannian into strata, which are called Matroid strata, which are given by the Matroid. So I'm fixing which points on the, are on the same line or which vectors are linearly dependent and which are linearly independent. And that's going to be some subset of the Grassmannian. So this Grassmannian is subdivided into strata labeled by uh, Matroids. OK? Uh, now, we talk about these Matroids, and I, I'll already give you an example, but actually I haven't defined Matroids yet. So let me give you a definition of Matroid. So Matroid is a, okay, Matroid is a subset of a uh, so definition. <coughs> okay, let me define it here. M is a subset in uh, M choose K. That's the Matroid Roid M of rank K. Uh, and elements of this M are called bases of Pantroids. Elements I in M are called bases. So if this collection of bases satisfy the following exchange axiom. So what's the exchange axiom is that for any pair of bases i and j in the matroid and uh, little i in capital I, there exist little j in capital J such that if I exchange little i with little j, uh, I take i, capital I minus little i, union with little j, and also I take capital J minus little j, union with little i. So these are also going to be bases. So they also belong to M. So for any little i, there exists a little j, such that we can exchange two elements in a basis, i and j, and still get two bases. So that's called a matroid. That's the exchange axiom. And I just want to compare this exchange axiom with the Pluca relation that I wrote before. So let me remind you that we had a Pluca relation. Delta i times delta j equals to sum plus or minus delta i minus little i union with little j times delta j minus little j union with little, well, you don't probably don't see, but it should be union with little i. Well, I mean, exactly these two guys. You can slide it together. I cannot slide it. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh. oh, that's good. A lot of space. OK, anyway, so we have this exchange axiom. OK, so let me move it here. Now I want to kind of put one next to the other. So that's. And you have an eraser. It's a special bonus. Yeah. OK, anyway, so what I want to show that this uh, exchange axiom is uh, basically combinatorial analog of the Pluca relation. 
So again, if you look at this blue correlation, and again, we don't care about the exact values of the Plucker. We don't know exact values of the Plucker coordinates. But we know whether they are equal to zero or not equal to zero. So what's the combinatorial information can we deduce from this relation? The only thing, if you think about this for a moment, the only thing that you can say is that if these two guys are not zero, if the left-hand side, it means that i and j are basis, that means that the left-hand side is not zero, not zero, there should be at least one term in the right-hand side which is not zero. That's exactly this exchange axiom. Okay, so so these are matroids, and um, okay, but you should be aware that matroids are not in one-to-one -one correspondence with matroid strata. Yeah. Excuse me. What is the, the quantifier on i? The exchange axiom. Could you read the exchange axiom? Yeah, yeah. Once again. Exchange axiom that for any two Old. capital. Old. 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 And what Old. is about small i? Also for any for any little i here there exists little j here. And again you ask about what if little j this little i belongs both to i and j. If it belongs to both i and j, that's kind of a trivial statement because we can always take little j to be equal to little i. OK. It's only kind of non-trivial if little i does not belong to capital J. OK. So that's the exchange axiom. That's the combinatorial analog. And uh, the objects that let's satisfy these axioms are matroids. So for any matroid, we can define this stratum on the Grassmannian. Matroid, well, S, M. That's the set of all elements of the Grassmannian such that, I mean, delta i equals to z not equal to zero if and only if i belongs to our matroid. Okay, so that means that these strata are labeled by matroids, but you should be aware that there are some matroids for which these strata are empty. So there are some matroids which are called non-realizable matroids. So matroids that satisfy the exchange axiom, but you cannot actually, so they satisfy these conditions, but you cannot actually pick some concrete values of the Plucker coordinates that satisfy the Plucker relation. <coughs> and the most famous example of uh, non-realizable matroids So the most famous example is called Fano plane. So let me draw the picture. Again, I'm going to represent, it's going to be k equal rank equals to 3. That means that there are going to be pictures given by points on the plane. So that's, oh, no. So let me try to. OK. So far, it is realizable matroid because we have a concrete configurations. So this picture says that, well, let me put some labels on these numbers, on the vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. So that means that 1, 2, 3 is not a base because these three points are on the plane, on the line, but 1, 2, 4 is a base. OK, so far, it's realizable matroid because we have a configuration given by lines, but now let me kind of add imaginary line, which is not a line, like make a circle here. So just say that, let's pretend that these three points are on the same line. So it means that 2, 4, and 6 is not a base. Okay, so kind of remove one base. But you are cheating. <laughs> so question depends on the field you are working. Yeah, right, it depends. It depends, but let's say field equals to R. OK, right, so there, I'm not cheating, but I'm uh, <laughs> skipping a lot of details. Uh, so this particular matroid is not realizable, say, over R, because it's realizable, actually, over a field with two elements, because that's actually all elements of the, well, anyway. But it's not realizable over R because, I mean, because of the following reason, but these three points cannot be on the same line. So if you draw this configuration, then these points are not on the same line. 
Okay, so that's one example of non-realizable matroid. Let me give you another example that I like. Uh, it's related to another theorem known to ancient Greeks. It's called Papus theorem. So you have a so what's Papus theorem? You draw this configuration of uh, lines. Oh no, I don't. You don't need these two, but you need these two. And this Papus theorem says that if you draw this configuration of lines, then, like say, on the real Euclidean plane, then these three intersections should be on the same line. So actually, so this, like, if you so this configuration forces, like Papus, this configuration of lines forces these three intersection points to be on the same line. But now I'm going to do the like, opposite thing that I did here. I'm going to add this base. Let, let me now pretend that these three points are not on the same line. Kind of erase this line, this dotted line. Say, again, let's say these points are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Eight nine. So I'm going to remove base seven. Sorry, add base seven eight nine to this matroid. And again, you can check that it satisfies the exchange axiom, but it's not realizable because it contradicts Papus theorem. Okay. So this is kind of examples, kind of give you the feeling where the. So is it not realizable over field? This I don't know about like finite fields. So yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe somebody knows better, but uh, over R is definitely non-realizable, and over C. Yeah, well, uh, okay, I'm not sure, yeah, maybe it's true for characteristic zero, for characteristic not zero, it's, for finding, uh, well, anyway, so. Uh -huh. And there is another, so basically you can pick any, like, your favorite geometrical theorem, like the Zargos theorem, and create some uh, non-realizable matroids from this theorem. OK. Uh, OK, so I'm kind of probably did maybe two-thirds of the things that I was planning to do. Uh, but let me, so I have uh, maybe five more minutes. So we talk about, let me do one more thing. So we talk about uh, uh, this uh, moment map. And the image of the Grassmannian under the moment map was this nice hypersimplex, I spoil it up. So actually, it's, you don't need to take the whole hypersimplex. You can pick a generic point on the, on the Grassmannian, act by the toes, and take the image of the moment map, then you get the whole hypersimplex. But that happens only if you take a, pick a generic point. But now, if you pick a non-generic point, pick a point that belongs to one of these smaller dimensional matroid strata, and I get, again, act by the toes, you will get a smaller we'll get a smaller polytope. Okay, and these polytopes, they're called matroid, well, they're examples of so-called matroid polytopes. So what these matroid polytopes are, mm, okay, so let me raise definition of matroids. So, so you are saying that those strata are stable at the direction of the toes. Yes. We so also say that they're, they're, they're which is obvious, yeah. We yeah. say that they are orbits of the direction? No, they're not orbits, they're far from being orbits. So, for example, one of these strata, like almost all points, generic points, on, like almost it's open, there is one open stratum, which is definitely very far from being a torus orbit. But, but what I'm saying is that the combinatorial type of the polytope, so if you pick a torus orbit, then the, and you pick the image of the moment map, the, this image, this polytope, depends on the stratum where this point is located. And this polytope is the following. So if you have M, a subset. Sorry, what, what are we doing now? I want to. No, 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 just. Uh, I want to generalize uh, hypersimplex. Okay. OK, so before we talk about hypersimplex, now I'm going to talk a little bit about more general polytopes that correspond to smaller dimensional strata. And uh, these polytopes are the following. So you pick any M here, and for 
What? A matrix. No, yeah. so far even oh. like any subset. Okay. For any subset M, you can define the polytope, which is equal to the convex hull of points E sub I. So let me say E sub I is the zero one vector corresponding to subset I. So it's sum over little i in capital I, little E sub of the coordinate vectors. That's a zero one vector. And I'm going to take the convex hull of these zero one vectors, but only for I in M. Okay? So in other words, I'm taking this uh, hypersimplex and just picking any subset of vertices of this hypersimplex and taking the convex hull. Claim is that this polytope, if M is a realizable matroid, then this polytope is exactly the moment polytope for a point for the orbit inside, inside of the corresponding stratum. Okay? So this is a... And uh, there is a very nice uh, result famous theorem, which is due to Gareski, McPherson, oh, uh, 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 Gelfand, Gareski, McPherson, Serganova, GGMS, that gives you characterization of matroids in terms of these polytopes. So we can tell whether M is matroid or not just by looking at this polytope. So for matroids, this polytope has a very nice feature. Namely, M is a matroid if and only if polytope all edges of this polytope are edges of the hypersimplex. So you have again, so let me tell you what I mean. So let me draw again I think that's the last thing that I'm going to do today. So you are going to take this, say, octahedron. Again, this example. This hypersimplex. Okay, so its vertices are zero one vectors. Any subset M corresponds to any subset of vertices of this polytope. Now, this M is a matroid if the convex hull of this subset of vertices, the all edges of this polytope will be edges which are already drawn on this picture. So, for example, if you remove just one element from this polytope, remove, say, the bottom vertex, so then you get a py the pyramid. <coughs> And you see, then you did this in the pyramid, you cannot create any new edges. So all edges that you have here are, are already in this picture. That means that this corresponding subset is a matroid. So this picture represents a matroid. But for example, suppose you remove the bottom vertex and also this vertex, like on the other side that you don't see here, this one. So then what you get is a polytope. You get uh, this uh, tetrahedron. So it has all these edges and a new one. So in this new one, this new edge, this Doyle edge, which is not shown here in the original picture, tells us that this is not a matroid. So that's not a matroid. So that's the geometrical way to kind of uh, see uh, what matroid or not a matroid is. And uh, later, so in the next uh, lecture, I'm going to, well, maybe I should say some preview of the next thing is that, oh, maybe I shouldn't tell you preview. Maybe I just, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, but we'll, this will continue tomorrow.